ILS. And um, as you both know, you'll have 15 minutes to present your arguments. And uh, obviously, the appellant may reserve five minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Neil Ironwall for the appellant, uh, mother. Teddy Furthermore, Your Honor, I will be speaking for eight minutes. Adam Vanderbilt will be speaking for four minutes, and I'll reserve three minutes for a rebuttal. Now, the one thing that I would mention is, uh, you probably all know this, but I just sometimes there's a reminder, don't use children's names, please. You know, we're, yes, we're going to be on uh, video and so forth, so we don't want to use the kids' sure. names. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, regarding my first assignment of error, I'll get right into it. The uh, agency, when they filed their motion for permanent custody, also filed a motion for a reasonable efforts bypass. And the reason uh, I believe they argued was because mom had children previously permanently custodied out, and that is a statutory ground for a reasonable efforts bypass. Uh, that hearing was never held. There was no, they just filed the motion. It was never ruled upon, or it was never set for a hearing. There was never notice. None of that was ever done. We did. At the time they filed the reasonable efforts bypass, the agency also filed a motion for permanent custody of this baby. We had a hearing for the permanent custody, and that's the only hearing, and when you look at the docket, you'll see, notice, permanent custody hearing shall be held on such and such date and time. So, we had the permanent custody hearing. At the conclusion of the hearing, the, for the first time, the prosecutor says, uh, Your Honor, uh, we want you to make a ruling on the reasonable efforts bypass. Uh, Mom's attorney, with, which was me, said, uh, Your Honor, I would like to have a hearing. If you don't grant the permanent custody, we'd like to have the matter remanded back to the magistrate so we can have a hearing on the reasonable efforts bypass and why it should not be granted. And the prosecutor said, well, I think you should just rule based upon the evidence at the permanent custody hearing. Um, the judge didn't indicate one way or the other what she'd do because she hadn't made a decision on the permanent custody at that time. Uh, thereafter, she ruled... She denied the permanent custody motion, but then said, oh, the reasonable efforts is granted. And that's all she did, as far as the reasonable efforts. Now, I'm arguing, as my first assignment of error, as a matter of due process, we had a right to know that the matter would be set for a hearing on the reasonable efforts bypass at the same time as the permanent custody, if that's what the judge was going to do. There's no notice. We had no warning. Even at the beginning of the permanent custody, we had no idea that the reasonable efforts, we don't know on what basis she granted it, because when she issued her decision, under the statute it says you have to make specific findings for the reasonable efforts bypass. She made none. She just said reasonable efforts is granted. Permanent custody denied, reasonable efforts uh, bypass granted. So we're arguing as a matter of due process, we had no ability to fight it, we had no notice, I couldn't present any evidence. We didn't know, and I specifically said, Your Honor, I'd like a hearing before you make a, there's a ruling on it. And she didn't indicate one way or the other what she would do. So we're arguing as our first assignment of error, um, that should be reversed. But factually, did counsel not um, agree to one of the reasons for reasonable efforts to bypass? Agree that, did, did, was, the, was the commentary before the trial court such that, yes, we can stipulate that, that, um, other, that the older siblings have been um, subject to a permanent custody by the, to the state. We, we never discussed that as far as reasonable efforts bypass, Your Honor. But uh, did, I'm sorry. I guess I'm asking a specific question as to what was agreed in the facts as opposed to, we never stipulated to a reasonable efforts bypass, but did you stipulate to the fact that the kid, the older children had been um, taken custody of by the state? Yes, for the E ground on the permanent custody. When, uh, the first permanent custody hearing or the second? Uh, I think the second. Not. I'm sorry, Your Honor, I don't recall specifically. Okay. Uh, um, but, but we never mentioned reasonable efforts bypass at any time in the hearing until the closing argument. And that was the first. Well, actually, the judge mentioned, and you'll read in the transcript, um, because the prosecutor said, well, reasonable efforts bypass, the judge's like, we're not here to discuss reasonable efforts. This is not the time to bring it up in the middle of a permanent custody hearing. Um, we're not going to discuss reasonable efforts. Um, and you'll see in the transcript that she said that specifically. Um, so I'm arguing, so I was put on notice that we're not dealing with reasonable efforts, or any of the exceptions why the court should not grant or reasonable efforts bypass. It's not simple, she had prior children uh, permanently custody, and therefore reasonable efforts is automatically granted. That is an absolute ground. If you read the statute, it says 
the judge can deny it anyways because she has the discretion, and there's exceptions that I wanted to argue why the court should not grant the reasonable effort bypass. As far as my moving on to my second assignment of error, during the uh, hearing, I uh, when when Children Services files a motion for permanent custody, they don't have to engage in reasonable efforts from the date of permanent custody filed all the way up until the decision, uh, until the hearing at least. I argued during the permanent custody hearing, the agency attempted to introduce all this evidence that occurred after the permanent custody motion had been filed to talk about things that they supported for permanent custody. I argued, Your Honor, permanent custody was filed on this date. They have to find permanent custody as it existed on that date based upon the evidence and grounds that existed on the date of their filing for permanent custody. The judge said, no, um, I disagree. I can consider evidence up to, the ta up, to the, up to the date of the hearing on whether or not it should be granted or not based upon the evidence today. But the problem with that, if I may, Your Honor, is the agency doesn't have to help the parents in any way after permanent custody has been filed. So if mom doesn't do services or doesn't get referrals or anything, that's OK because the agency doesn't have to help them with it. But then they use it to say, well, mom hasn't done the referrals. She hasn't done her visits. She hasn't done this or that. But they didn't assist her in any way. So they're using it both as a sword and a shield at the same time. They're saying, we don't have to help her. And the fact that she didn't do anything, we're going to use that after the evidence, of, after the date of the filing for permanent custody. So we're arguing whatever the conditions that led to them to file permanent custody, that is the date frozen and you know, cut in stone. Whatever evidence up to that date is what they should be limited to. Now, recently, the, this court held, for adjudication purposes, the date the agency files a complaint for, permit, or for abuse, offense, and neglect, that is the evidence up to that date. Evidence subsequent to the filing of that complaint is not admissible to prove abuse, offense, and neglect. So I'm arguing virtually the same thing for permanent custody. Now, moving on to my third assignment of area, Your Honor, and this is very important. The agency filed a dependency complaint, and they got a finding of dependency, and then we had a dispositional hearing, and the case plan was adopted, the, children, the child was kept in temporary custody. Two months later, just barely 60 days, the agency files for permanent custody. We had a hearing, and Judge Teodosio held 60 days, two months, is just an insufficient amount of time for permanent custody. That doesn't give parents hardly any time to engage in reasonable case plan compliance. I'm not granting permanent custody. Motion denied. Fine. Agency then waited, from that decision of her denial, they waited four weeks, exactly four weeks, one month, and they refiled for permanent custody all over again. So, and this time the judge says, oh, I find there's been now the three months that the case plan has been in existence, I find that's more than sufficient time because and I argued, Your Honor, my client's entitled to a one-year reunification effort. She says, well, if I consider the prior cases and the time you had to work, the mom had the time to work on those case plans, and then we add that time to this case, mom has had more than enough time to work on reunification efforts. And I'm kind of astounded by that argument. First of all, each, that case plan from the prior children is not relevant or germane to the case plan in this case. There was no comparison as the services in the prior case to this case. Mom had no idea, none of us had any idea that the timeline from the prior case, the time she had to work on that, somehow gets automatically added onto the timeline of this case. If two months is insufficient time to work a case plan, how is three months a sufficient amount of time to work the case plan? That, I, this court has already held in a prior case six months is an exceedingly short amount of time to do a permanent custody. That's hardly enough time to do a case plan uh, for reunification. Here, we have two months, and the judge says two months is just not enough time, but when, when I add the other four, four weeks, now we have enough time for the parents to have worked on reunification efforts. And as you read, you'll see that the caseworker said, I provided no services, I didn't contact her employer, I didn't, I didn't see but one visit. I didn't do my job because I, I intended to file for permanent custody 
right from the get-go. So I don't have to do much, I didn't do much, because our intention was to do permanent custody from beginning to end. So uh, based upon these facts, Your Honor, I'd ask the court to reverse um, and remand for further proceedings. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. Attorney Adam Vietnam on behalf of Father Jeffrey Storey. Um, I'm going to say something I never thought I would ever say in my career, and that is I agree with Mr. Agarwal. <laughs> um, and I would just ask, the, I would just adopt his arguments uh, as mine with regards to my file to assignments of error. My, my main concern in this case actually um, piggybanks on his, but also the due process violations my client had with regards to the suspension of his visitation. Um, this is not only concerning, I think, in this case, but in cases going forward where the prosecutor's office filed without any supporting documentations, affidavits, anything of that nature, a uh, motion on behalf of Children's Services to suspend visitation. This happened only 10 days after uh, the dispositional hearing and asked that father's visitation be suspended. And, and, and I would agree that if the facts contained therein were somehow brought forth in a hearing or in some kind of affidavit, there, there might have been a reason that to suspend his visitation. But essentially what you had was you had a prosecutor filing a motion and testifying as to facts for which they weren't a, bit, a witness uh, present, anything of that nature. And then you have a long-term suspension. It's an ex parte motion, too. So there was no chance to respond, no opportunity to respond, no opportunity to be heard. And then the, the hearing is set for 53 days later after the holiday season still not held, then still not held as we go through the rest of the hearings in this case. Um, and the concern that I have is, is it was just an absolute ab abandonment of his due process rights. There should have been either A, some sort of supporting documentation, police reports, uh, affidavits, things of that nature to support the assertions made in the motion, or B, there should have been a hearing and then a, a, on an emergency basis to determine whether or not his visitation should have been suspended. That's my major concern. I, 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 you know, the, there seems to be no logical basis uh, provided, either in the court record or just in general, uh, to support why there would be this prolonged um, removal of the father from the child's life. And we're, at one point, we're trying to tell him, you need to do all these things in order to keep, uh, to fight for your children, but at the same time, we're going to remove the incentive, essentially the ability to even have contact. Counsel, the, the state has argued in its brief that um, father knew that all he had to do to reinstitute visitation was to complete his counseling requirements. What are we going to find in the record to show that, that father knew that, whether that is the case or not, that he, they would be reinstituted if he, he went to counseling? What are we going to find in the record about his knowledge of that requirement to reinstitute? To re I, I don't think there really is anything to support the idea that he knew or should have known. I mean, but what I'm saying is he should have at least had the opportunity to be heard on the issue. Um, and, you know, to say he should have done this, should have done this, whatever, that's one thing. But he wasn't even afforded the opportunity to present, you know, his side of, of the allegations. Um, nor was there an opportunity to cross-examine anybody who actually made those statements. Those statements were made in a, in a written motion filed by the prosecutor's office with no ability to cross-examine, to question, to judge the veracity of it. And so that's what my concern is, is that just the idea you can have your, your visitation is such a suspended for the rest of the case plan. Was, and, a, was that argument made to the trial court? There was no opportunity to make that argument. I mean, there, there was no brief filed by his attorney. That's what the court's asking. No. Nor was there any argument made to the I would have to defer to the record because I, I don't believe that there was much of anything made. It was just 
he didn't have an opportunity realistically ever to work with the child. Um, and it, and I, think, I believe it should have been more developed within the record itself. But um, I, I think when you're still looking at best efforts, you still have to be able to see one of the factors is the child's bonding with the, with the father. He, he wasn't given the opportunity. Um, and, and, but my concern is really the due process issue, the fact that he didn't have an opportunity to respond. I mean, that there was no effective opportunity to get to have a hearing, especially when I mean, it, it can't, a, court, a hearing should have been set right away on CSP's motion. Thank you, Councilman. Unfortunately, may it please the court. Evan D. Martino, on behalf of the Summit County Children's Services Board, we are asking that this court affirm the decision of the trial court granting the agency beyond the capacity of this child. Uh, with regard to the reasonable efforts bypass issue, uh, the agency would ask this court to find, first of all, that the uh, reasonable efforts bypass the facts that were introduced at the first hearing, which included testimony by caseworker Garrow on page 73 to 76 of the transcript, was in fact that mother did have three children that were recently, one month actually before the birth of this child, placed in the permanent custody of CSB. Um, the court did indicate at that first hearing on page 231 to 232 that the court would address the bypass issue in its decision on permanent custody, and there was no objection made at that time. On a, I believe it was about page 248, Attorney Agarwal asked that the court um, remand the matter for a hearing if the court did in fact find that there was not permanent custody. But initially when the court addressed it, there was no objection made. Furthermore, um, the court found at the second permanent custody hearing that there was reasonable efforts made by the agency. So I think this whole argument is moot nonetheless um, since there was reasonable efforts finally made. Uh, with regard to whether there's a due process violation, um, I don't understand or see the harm that uh, can be found to have occurred when there would, what would have been done differently if there had been a separate hearing on the bypass issue. The, the evidence that was introduced covered um, one of the prongs for the bypass, which was that the three kids were placed in the permanent custody of the agency. Everything that was uh, evidentiary um, matter presented during that permanent custody hearing would be the same information that would have been put forth at a separate bypass mm -hmm. hearing. And then, again, the agency did file just a month later, as Mr. Agarwal indicated, for permanent custody. And then the court found that we had engaged in reasonable efforts. So I don't think that this assignment of error has any merit, and I believe that it should be um, overruled. With regard to the, um, the issue of how long does the agency have to wait after a finding of permanent custody, um, that there was not sufficient evidence for the permanent custody. I don't know if this court um, is being asked to make a bright line rule that it has to be a certain number of months that pass. I don't know how any court could take on that task when every case is so different. Every uh, parent, or whether it's a mother and a father, or just a mother, just a father, just a, you know, a grandparent and custodian, every case is different. Every case may have uh, you know, a background where CSB is involved before, and it may not. In this case, we had a situation where three children were placed in permanent custody of the agency in August, and then another child is born in September, and we know that these parents have done nothing to remedy the situation that brought the three children in because they've been placed in permanent custody of the agency. So we know all those same concerns are there, including father's mental health issues, he's subject to outbursts, he's subject to threats, he's threatened Mr. Garrow, the caseworker, before. This case starts and, as expected, because they have not remedied the situation that brought the three children into care in the first place, we see the same behaviors. They're not engaging in substance abuse evaluation or treatment, they're not engaging in mental health counseling, and what happens? At visitation, we have father getting upset by a letter he receives and crumpling up the letter and you know, threatening people, telling Mr. Garrow um, later that he knows where he lives and where his kids live, um, making you know, very inappropriate comments to the point that the visitation staff engage an officer to escort father out. And 
Mr. Garrow testified on page um, 30 and 31 that he told the father that all he had to do to get his visitation reinstated was engage in mental health counseling. So that is in the record. So what would have happened differently if they had had this hearing, if they had had a hearing on the reason why the visitation was suspended? The same evidence would have been introduced. You would have heard from the, the visitation worker who testified at the hearing about what the father did, the statements that he made, the fact that they had to get the officer involved. Then you would have heard from the caseworker who would say, I told the father that he, all he had to do was engage in mental health counseling and he didn't do it. So all those things are in the record. Um, there is no um, indication other than this motion that was filed you know, sometime between the suspension of the visitation and the permanent custody hearing that dad wanted to have the court address it. But there's also nothing in the record at the permanent custody hearing, the first one or the second or anywhere else, that it would have been in the child's best interest to have visitation with father after the way father was acting. And he had untreated mental health issues. And this issue has not been just since the beginning of this case, it's been all the way throughout the last case for which father ended up going to prison for child endangerment with regarding one of those three children. So there is a long history here. So to argue that the court erred by allowing the agency to file for PC one month after it was denied, it's just, it's illogical. It's, it's, I mean, how long should we wait based on these facts? And how can you say that there's a, a bright line amount of time for these cases? They're so different. And what is important is the best interest of the children, not so much whether, you know, father was prohibited from visiting with his child when he was not doing the things that were necessary for him to be a good influence and to him help his child. Um, so based on um, the counsel, yes. Um, <clears throat> Right, that, that's untrue. I know that the, um, the case plan changes as far as the goals um, go from reunification towards permanent custody, but we still work with the parents. I, I find it hard to believe um, that counsel is truly advocating that once the agency files for permanent custody, everything that happens after that is not relevant and is error for it to be introduced because we have seen cases where we file for permanent custody and that's what the parents, for some reason, it gets their attention. And all of a sudden, they're working on a case plan. And by the time we get to the hearing date, we sometimes withdraw that motion. And we will ask for instead a six month extension or maybe um, legal custody to somebody else. So how could that not still be relevant, what they do after permanent custody? Sometimes these hearings are months out. And sometimes the parents do suddenly realize, I'm really, I'm losing my child. Now I'm gonna start doing this case plan. I'm gonna really work at the things that I need to do. I have not seen a single case where a court has held that once that motion is filed that everything stops, that the agency doesn't have to do anything for the best interest of the child, that they have no you know, interest in working with the parents or working towards, um, excuse me, getting things for that child. That just, that doesn't, that doesn't happen that way. And I, I I'm 100% confident that if this mother had, or this father had, engaged in significant af efforts after we filed that second motion, that counsel would be in here advocating that this court has an obligation and that it would be a, a violation of their client's due process because it's the most significant you know, decision that a court can make is terminating the parental rights and how can you not look at what my, my clients have done? So I, I don't think that that's a, an accurate well, statement of the law. Well, actually what I was getting at was mm -hmm. um, four weeks after mm -hmm. you know, filing a yeah. permanent custody motion, and um, you know, four weeks isn't a lot of time. And then <clears throat> if the, after the first filing of the permanent custody motion, the, mm -hmm. the agency isn't even looking at reunification again, how can the court change its mind then and say, 60, 60 days wasn't enough, but now four weeks with not even re reunification as the goal mm -hmm. is sufficient now. Right. Well, the, the testimony.
testimony was that the agency was still engaging in efforts towards reunification. There's that this comment about how the caseworker testified that he wasn't doing anything because the goal was um, permanent custody is is untrue. There's nothing in the record of that sort. Um, attorney, uh, excuse me, caseworker Darrow testified about the fact that he told the father he needed to engage in mental health counseling. He talked about the places where they were referred, mom and dad, and they didn't do it. So that that statement is is it's just not true. It's, not consistent with the record. But it, but it seems like an argument could be made that, that basically the trial court was looking at the previous years, really, and not, not compliance with case plans. The, the court, any effort. The court, well, one of the factors the court looks at is the custodial history, history of the child with the agency and the, and the parents. So the agent, I think that is a proper factor, a best interest factor for the court to consider is whether the parents have remedied the situation. And the court certainly would have the knowledge that this case had been filed right. but, immediately after. But the, but the argument was, we haven't been given enough time. And the court said in its findings, well, you had years before mm -hmm. the drug issue. Right. And that the court did say that. But it, there's no indication that the court went beyond its the scope of what it's allowed to decide in this case based on the evidence that was there. This family just did not do anything in this case. And if we don't have 12 out of 22, then we can file by saying the parents could right, could not be placed, could not or should not be placed, um, the child should not be placed with them, could not or should not. So we don't have to wait a year, and we don't have to you know, ignore the history that the court has with the family either. It's just one of the factors. If there are no other questions, I rest on my brief. Thank you. Oh, you're out of time. I'm oh. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much. All right, so the court will take the matter under advisement and a written opinion will issue and be sent to the parties. And also, we release on our website.